Welcome to another episode of the SNC podcast. I am your host, Falashare Anoje. Before I get on with this episode, I want to take a moment to speak about the global health pandemic. The negative impact from the coronavirus disease is crushing and heartbreaking. My thoughts and prayers are also with the hundreds of thousands of people who are sick and have lost loved ones to COVID-19. Hopefully, a cure is found soon. I'm also thankful for all the health officials here in Nigeria and around the world who are doing their absolute best despite the circumstances. Please continue to stay safe. On this episode, I spoke with Oliver Nwomu, a respected visual artist, brand strategist, art administrator, and curator based in Lagos, Nigeria. We spoke about the state of visual arts in Nigeria, the process behind art valuation, art forgery, and more. Oliver Emo, welcome to the SNC podcast. Thank you, Shadi. Thank you so much for being here. Happy and to be. I am excited about the conversation that we're going to be having today. Yeah. But before we get knee deep into the conversation, yeah. let me introduce you. Sure. Good? So you are an artist, curator, art administrator author, writer, publisher, and brand strategist. You're also the founder, executive director, and trustee of the Ben M. Momo Foundation. In addition, you are the president of the Society of Nigerian Artists, director of Omenka Gallery, and CEO of Revelo. Did I get that right? Revelo. 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 <laughs> Revelo Company Limited. You sit on the boards of various organizations, including the Reproduction Rights Society of Nigeria and the Lagos Bien... Is that... How do you pronounce that? Bien, Biennial? Correct. Biennial. Okay. And I would be remiss if I didn't add that your father was the late celebrated Nigerian creative artist, Professor Benedict Chukukadibia. And we'll... Good try. <laughs> <laughs> How, what, what, Good was, try. what was up about that? Okay, Chuku Kadibia Okay. So what was it like growing up with a father like yours? And how did that, if it did, affect how you perceive and appreciate the arts? Well, it was very interesting, uh, now that I think about it in retrospect, because um it's um it's very easy for an artist's son to imbibe some of his father's uh, uh, leanings. I mean, I grew up smelling paint around the house. I saw him sculpt, you know, so this made a very strong impression on me as a child. And uh, while growing up, uh, he was very happy to notice, observe rather, that uh, I had uh, talent and it was very encouraging. You know, while I was at King's College, I knew that he helped me cheat on a couple of assignments, <laughs> art assignments, and he was very proud that uh, I won prizes while at St. Savior's, even at primary school. Uh -huh. So he was a very encouraging father, very supportive, and he always wanted, you know, his um, his children to always be busy. He couldn't mm -hmm. stand uh, anyone who wasn't doing anything at a particular time. He always wanted you to be busy, and he always believed in excellence. So he believed in whatever you do, you make sure that you do it to the best of your ability. So that was very important. And these were lessons that we grew up learning. Great. And was he the kind of father that said, okay, it's great that you have this artistic or creative background, but I still want you to go to school and become a doctor? Or he was supportive of the fact that if you want to pursue this professionally, go ahead and do that. Well, he always wanted his kids to um, pursue the academics, so very important. Um, but uh, I was his youngest son, mm. or I am his youngest son, and he wanted... Uh, his youngest son to be a priest. Wow. So I turned out wrong. <laughs> 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 so I was supposed to be the one dedicated. Yeah. To that. Yes. Wow. So you were like, yes. so were you like, <laughs> I'm sorry. What a priest I, would have I know, out. right? <laughs> when I was young, I wanted to become a nun because no, of oh Sound my. of Music. So we share I know. Yes. And then I realized that yes. the life that I live, yes. I would be kicked out of the convent. No <laughs> <laughs> Same here. So we share a lot in yeah, common. Right. So Very what refreshing. I to know. know. So yes. what about your mom? Well, was she was she also supportive of you? My mother was supportive, but uh, as uh, far as I can remember, 
she always wanted me to be a doctor. Mm. Yes, I was supposed to be a neurosurgeon. Wow. But that turned out wrong as well. Yes. <laughs> Why did she want to become a neurosurgeon? Well, uh, because in her own time, she wanted to be a doctor herself. Oh, I yes. see. So she was kind of living her dreams through mm, me. Through you. Yes. Okay. But and before I move on, I should note that you graduated from the University of Lagos, Nigeria, yes. where you earned a degree in biochemistry yes. and advanced diploma in exploration geophysics yes. with the distinction yes. and a postgraduate diploma in Applied Geophysics and Visual Arts, yes. also with the distinction. Yes. And you also hold the distinction as the best graduating master's in art history student from Unilag. Yes. Uh, now, I'm going to start off asking, yes. why do you think that a lot of Nigerians are afraid to talk about death? Well, that's a very complex question. Okay. But I think that um, a lot of people, especially in Nigerians, we grew up with family. You know, family around us, we have lots of shared relationships, a lot of, sh of, um, of um, shared ambitions. So no one ever really feels he's had enough time to achieve or accomplish this, uh, these things that he set out for himself or herself. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people still feel very attached to their loved ones. I think Nigerians... Uh, by virtue of who they are, they're very full of life. I mean, think about Lagos with all this chaos and the hustle and bustle of Lagos. You know, people enjoy that. So no one wants to just leave that behind, you know, just like that. So in as much as we're a very religious country and on every street, you see a church or two, but I think Nigerians still are very full of zest and life. Yeah, but do you think that in addition to being full of life and zest and all these things that we want to accomplish, it is still important that we have conversations regarding the fact that tomorrow anybody can die and Absolutely. we need to have proper plans in place on what, could, on what will happen when that person passes on. Oh, I agree with you. Um, it's very important to have plans in place. I think that uh, our corporate sector, they scream about this almost every day with pensions. They scream about it with what happens to the afterlife. And even artists, we artists are beginning to think because a number of us, you know, have passed away without leaving proper uh, plans in place for successive generations. So I think it's very important planning your estate, you know, when you pass away. It's very important. Yeah. Um, an artist knowing that uh, your works become ambassadors even after you've passed on. So what happens to these works? How are they cared for? How are they kept for the next generation? What happens to your history or your contributions to art You know, in your local country and even internationally? These are conversations that artists are beginning to have and collectors are beginning to have. What happens to their collections after? Yeah, because I, I asked that question because it goes to part of the conversation we're going to be having today, which is... Super. You're the heir of a famous creative, yes. and you lost your father in 1994, right? Yes. Did your father have conversations regarding having an estate plan? Yes. And did he also talk about what he wanted yes. to happen while he was still alive and yes. after he died? Absolutely. He always uh, spoke of giving five of his works to the federal government of Nigeria, oh, wow. uh, while the rest, you know, were for our education, you know, to make sure that uh, each child is uh, educated to the best of their ability. So that was very important for him. So he five to the federal government, the rest were to be given to my mother, oh. you know, and to make sure that she, she trades exhibits, you know, and um, gains her sustenance from that for herself mm -hmm. and for her children. Okay, yes. so before he died, he had taken some legal and business steps on in putting putting oh, down. Yes. In, he right? had a will. Okay, so I mean, your father is not here, so I need to ask him all these yes. questions. I was just thinking about how, you know, how he went about choosing an executor. Yes. Just when we think about putting together an estate plan, yes. there there are certain steps people have to take yes. in order for the um, estate plan to actually function properly. And I just wanted to talk about that. Yes. After your father died, you and your siblings, how? What was going through your mind in terms of keeping your father's legacy at the forefront of Nigerian culture, Nigerian art culture? Because it's one thing for your father to say he wants to have five pieces of art go to the government and Absolutely. the rest to your mother. But you as children, what was going through your minds in order to secure his legacy? Well, it was very important for us because uh, when he passed away, even in his lifetime, we had people coming over to do their research on him. We know a lot of artists 
on uh, those in the academia today who have gained their PhDs, just some research work on him. So it's very important for us to put all of this together. Uh, my mom busied herself with uh, making sure that his written manuscripts were properly typed. She spent a lot of wow. hours, you know, making sure that was put together. So my siblings and I sat down and we thought about the best way to preserve his legacy in a structured format. And then we thought about the foundation. And because I'm, I know, I'm an artist and I was the one in the art, they all decided to support me mm -hmm. in making sure that uh, you know we have this foundation that is established to preserve his legacy. And the foundation was established in 2003, mm -hmm. you know, and um, through exhibitions, debates, you know, residencies, you know, we try as much as possible, you know, to preserve his legacy. Um, now we're working on the catalog resume, which uh, is a compendium of all these known pieces because we're trying to stem the spate of forgeries that are. That, um, you know, of course, when an artist begins to appreciate and value, you have unscrupulous people who want to make quick money from mm. it. So that has been, you know, one of the um, um, uh, one of our approaches to ensure that we preserve his legacy. And preserving his legacy also means even merchandise, anything within his image. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, we even have uh, the international community of academics, you know, who write every now and then. Those who are doing books who want images of his work. So we're busy with that. And we're also planning more exhibitions both uh, on the local and international scene. Okay. You know, just um, a couple of years ago, the Tate in the UK had an exhibition, you know, um, with uh, him, you know, at the forefront, you know, talking about Nigerian modernism mm. in art. So, of course, we're very happy to also work with these institutions in preserving and promoting his legacy. And you touched on something about yeah. forgeries. Yeah. How does... So, backtrack, a catalogue, raison a, is that how yes. you it? What, what is that exactly? It's a compendium of all his known works. Got it. You know, verified and authenticated. Okay. I think it's just important that we always break these terms down. Not everybody know go to school. <laughs> no, you did. You did. <laughs> <laughs> now, we talked about forgeries, right? Yes. How does that affect the, I guess, the standing of an artist's work? Because yes. pe people may just say, well, it's a forgery. Anybody would know what an original Ben and one will work is. Yes. But... Obviously, I, think, I feel like you have a different perspective on how forgeries affects your father's work, right? Yes. Okay, let's talk about that. Well, forgeries affect my father's work and every other artist, artist. in the sense that uh, it causes a depreciation of his works. You know, you have works that are done by um, artists that are not as strong, so it weakens, you know. I mean, with the general perspective, when people see a forgery that is extremely poor, you know, then you judge the artist based on that, mm. you know, and then collectors, I mean, the, the whole beauty about art is the exclusiveness of the art of a piece. You know, when an artist's piece is created in multiples, then each multiple becomes uh, smaller in value. Mm. So you can imagine a collector having uh, a piece where there are five of those, you know, then it's not as valuable as the proper piece. Got it. So in many ways, it affects uh, the value of an artist's work and is over. What, what is that, Uber? It's uh, um, his body of work. Got it, over. okay, yes. great. Now I want to move on to the work that you do. Yes. Like I mentioned in the beginning of our conversation, you yes. are a well-rounded creative and a businessman. Thank you. For example, you have exhibited your works across several countries, including Nigeria, yes. the United Kingdom, yes. United States, Ireland, and South Africa at the Joburg Art Fair. Art Fair. You also, your works also form part of many significant private and public government collections, including yes. the Bank of Industry, yes. the Delta State Government, and so many others. Yes. Now, for someone who wants to become an artist or is an artist and wants his or her work to become part of these types of collections. Can you talk about the process of how that happens? Let's start off first with how you go about having an exhibition. What does that even mean to have an exhibition as an artist? Well, uh, for me, an exhibition is about um, displaying your works, okay. introducing your work you know, to the public space, you know, to collectors, to critics. You know, so that uh, so usually you have something to say. An exhibition also serves uh, purposes of sales, so you can make money from it for your sustenance and to continue on pursuing your career. So for me, that's the two-pronged approach to uh, having an exhibition. Now, how do you go about having an exhibition? Before you go, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, that's okay. yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Um, I think that um, um, you start by creating your own philosophy 
because uh, not many spaces would want to show your work if you're not, you know, if you haven't reached a point where you have defined your philosophy. Mm. So, you, know, you need to get to a point where, you know, you are viewed upon as a serious artist because, you know, most of the spaces are galleries and these galleries already have already been in business for a while. So they want an artist who has a defined philosophy. You know, so he knows what he's doing, he's aware of his techniques, he's not just experimenting, you know. But the easiest way to start is probably through group exhibitions where you and maybe other artists of your ilk, you know, show together. Okay. So you can enter into group shows, you can have joint shows. And then for me, the peak of having an exhibition is when you have a solo show, which means that you are now ready. You're no mm. longer experimenting, but you have something to say, you know, about your work. Of course, it is true that artists will go on trying to strive to achieve perfection all through their careers, but you must get to some appreciable points, you know, where you can have shows. So they shouldn't be so regular, but uh, for me, these are the processes. Now, these days, the alternative spaces where you can have, you know, mm -hmm. exhibitions, but uh, the purists still believe that it should be a proper gallery space or you can have a museum show, you know, so I think uh, um, essentially these are the ways, but you must get into the public space. You know, for me, that's, um, you, you must gain some sort of public acceptance, you know, and that for me shows, you know, uh, how relevant your work will be. Okay, so don't just exist in the esoteric space, also be with, like I said, the public. Yes. I feel like sometimes maybe that's the issue that maybe visual artists or even just artists in general face is that sometimes you feel like you only your work seems to be only appreciated by people who have a certain level of whether it's intelligence, whether it's emotional intelligence or what's what I'm looking for, whether you go to school. You understand? And the common man cannot even see your painting yes. and understand what it's trying to to convey. So I think that's a very valid point that you made that, you know, you also want your work to be in yes. a public space. Now, would you consider yourself a purist? Um, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. But that for me is the beauty of art mm -hmm. because uh, I think it's the only profession where, you know, it's actually living mm. in the sense that there's an art to speaking, there's an art to wearing clothes, an art to working, well, and walking as well. But um, let's go back to art, you know, and... Um, Art can be viewed as a functional piece where you can even sit on it mm. or even as cooking utensils. And then you can actually have fine art, which, you know, are for appreciation purposes, aesthetic value. Then you can also have art for religious purposes. You know, there's so many varying functions of art that, you know, and people have even been known to have investment-worthy art. Mm. So it's even a store of value as well. So for me, it's so broad-based that it's difficult to box art into, um, you know, a framework, for instance. You know, and I think that um, uh, having said that, you have art that uh, exists in galleries. Well, you have art that's in public space, for instance, statues of Mandela, for instance, a public space, and mm -hmm. remind people of how great this man has been mm -hmm. in his lifetime, you know, and his contributions to society at mm -hmm. large. And then you have art that resonates in the public space, you know, whereby they used to embellish public buildings and spaces, you know, so people can connect, you know, for whatever reason, you know, um, they connect to these pieces. Yeah. In all the ancient Benin kingdom, for instance, you had art in the palace that told the story of the conquest, the history of the people, mm. and historians have been able to piece together the people's history just by putting together the art, art pieces. Yeah. So it's multifunctional, yeah. multidimensional, you know, and um, these days, artists in public spaces, I mean, judging from the international museums, where people even pay entry fees, you know, to go see art, and these days with technology, you can even immerse yourself mm -hmm. in your room, True. and that room itself constitutes the art. Yeah. So things have changed. Boundaries, boundaries are being blurred mm -hmm. every day, you know, so I think that art is all-embracing and so encompassing yeah. now that um, it's, um, it's, no, it's no longer tenable for anyone to say that art is elitist. So how do, as an artist, yes. how do you decide what price that you're going to allocate to your works? Well, I think, uh, let me speak broadly first about uh, how value is attributed to a piece. Um, first of all, um, you must consider the artist's uh, contributions to local, the local narrative, historical art narrative in his own community, perhaps his country, and then internationally, what, has, what have been his contributions to 
global narratives, you know, what schools has the artist attended? If he, the more prestigious the schools are, there's more the likelihood that his value or value for his work will be higher. Uh, where has he exhibited in his lifetime? Very important. And also, um, you know, um, who has bought his work? You know, such elements, even factors like that affect, for instance, if uh, a very famous person like Michael Jackson, you know, has bought a piece, even if it's the same work, you know, of similar size, similar year, similar theme by the same artist, it's more likely that that piece will cost more. Mm -hmm. You know, so these things are extremely important, you know. And of course, even within the mediums, there's a hierarchy, for instance, sculpture and painting cost the more traditional uh, mediums, for instance, might cost even more than the drawings, because drawings, you know, until fairly recently, were just uh, means of um, conceptualizing what you are going to produce. You know, they weren't viewed as a finished work in itself. And then uh, painting with oils, for instance, you know, might con con fetch considerably more mm -hmm. than uh, painting with pastels or watercolor, you know, because oil, for instance, is not only a traditional medium, but you know, has been known to last even longer than watercolor mm. that is um, um, susceptible to ultraviolet light, you know. Mm. Yes, so yeah. I think, broadly speaking, uh, how does an artist price his pieces? You know, there's also peer review. You know, what do your mates say about you? What do the critics say about your work? You know, these are very important things to consider when pricing your work. So if an upcoming artist, yes. uh, not even upcoming, I just, let's say I become a painter. Yes. You mentioned all these different things. So, for example, you went to a pre prestigious school and I went to a non-prestigious school. Yes. So, the way you're going to price your work yes. is you're going to give, you can give it a higher price because of the schools you've gone to compared to my schools. Well, yes, because uh, you know that uh, sometimes if you work with the gallery, the gallery helps to set your prices. Yeah. So, ultimately, you know, the galleries or your manager or your agent, mm -hmm. you know, sets the prices based on the market. Got now, it. you're only as good as what the market will offer sure. or pay for your work. Okay. So that is a very nice way of even settling things very yeah. easily. I just think that, you know, there's so many conversations that are happening or yes. people are just talking about the fact that your school shouldn't be the determinant of how, not even how successful you're going to be, but what sets the standard of how you're measured. Yes. So, because there are people who go to like prestigious schools and yes. their work is crap. Or they just don't have the talent. And someone maybe goes to Ogomosho, whatever school, I and because the school is not prestigious, and that person's a better artist. Well, um, um, it's just one factor. No, oh, yeah. The whole cocktail yes, of factors of course. that go into it. You know, but uh, there's a likelihood that because you went to a prestigious school, you can articulate what you're doing better. Of course. You've put the critical side of yes. your work. You've met better professors who can influence your trajectory. Mm -hmm. And even while you're at these schools, what sort of education would you get? For instance, if it's a prestigious school in London, for instance, like maybe the Slade, it goes without saying that some of those uh, lectures that you're going to have are going to be supervised by industry experts. So you're already noticed, you know, and if they see that you're a good student, for instance, they might develop interest in what you're doing. And of course that places you because already you're going to be introduced to prestigious galleries and galleries the, the primary market and they determine your work. Mm -hmm. So it's you're more likely to get that initial boost and exposure which will determine your prices and put you right there, right at the thick of the market, as opposed to if you studied here in Lagos or Benin, for instance, yeah. where you're limited by the influences that will, you know, boost your trajectory. Ergo, life isn't fair. Life isn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is it? Uh, these schools come with a history. No, of course. So, I, I so just, you, you must pay for that. No, I, I mean, you I, must benefit from I know. So, better well. packaging is, it, yes. is the moral of this story. Yes. <laughs> now, what is the best way to preserve artworks? Okay. Like, for example, the ones we have in your gallery oh, now. Yes. What's the best way to preserve them? Well, the best way to preserve uh, art, you know, at the very mundane level, is to make sure there's uh, the humidity you know, is right, you know, don't uh, have your works uh, very close to where there's a high content of moisture, you know, make sure, for instance, that uh, uh, your watercolors are not exposed to UV light, so you must face them away from sun sunlight, you know, you must have the right lighting, you know, on them, so that it's not destructive to them. Um, uh, for an instance, in a gallery like this, be careful about those who come in. They don't touch the pieces, mm. you know, especially with photography. 
you know, if it's not glassed, for instance, you don't want uh, the acid in your hands to affect it okay, later yeah. on. Uh, you must make sure children, you know, are not even allowed here to run around. Mm -hmm. If you're having an exhibition opening, for instance, even little things like people carrying wine glasses, mm -hmm. you know, they shouldn't come in because there's a tendency or you're at risk of uh, wine spilling on the works and damaging the piece. So these little rules are extremely important. Mm -hmm. You know, and how your work is framed is very important as well. If you, know, the, for instance, um, if you frame, you know, and the glass is touching the frame, you know, for instance, mm. there's a tendency that uh, in a humid environment, it will later on attach itself. Just to the glass. That, yes. So there has to be enough space. Yes. And even for artists, you know, you must work even from the outset with the right materials, materials that would last. You know, you should make sure that you use acid-free paper because later on, you're going to have brown patches or spots maybe the next 30 years on your, on your pieces. Mm -hmm. So these are things you must you know, you must take into consideration. And artists who don't prime their canvases or prepare their canvases properly before working have a tendency, you know, for those pieces to flake later on. So I also believe in preventive measures, you know, as well. Yeah. Those are very important as well. So having the right foundation from the, the right get-go is... If you're a sculptor who works in wood, you must make sure that the wood is properly dry. Otherwise, you're going to have cracks in it later on. Yeah. So all of these things are extremely important in preserving because even in preserving work, you also have to think about, you know, using the preventive measures as well. Okay. You know. So you have 13 years experience yes. and expertise from running a leading gallery in Africa, yes. which is Omenka Gallery. Yes. Can, you talk about, can you talk a bit about what makes Omenka Gallery unique? Well, there are many things. I like that question. It's a very interesting question because even the name Omenka has a meaning. What does it mean? It means, um, I mean, in Igbo land where I'm from, it means um, someone who's creative, someone mm. who it's is an gifted. Word. Yes, an Igbo oh, okay. word. Yes. And um, it's a word I derived from my father's uh, manuscripts because when he passed away, I was going through some of his things. You know, we spoke of that earlier when mm -hmm. I said, uh, sat down with my siblings to decide what better structure and what, what's the best way to preserve his legacy. And we were going through his scripts and I saw, I noticed that he was always going to have a gallery in his lifetime, which he never mm. accomplished. And he was going to call it Omenka. So I said to myself, well, if I ever have a gallery, it will be in fulfillment of his dream. Now, Omenka is an honorific you know, for someone who's very gifted, someone who's talented. Mm. And incidentally, Omenka was his own father's honorific because his father was a traditional sculptor of repute. Yeah, so course. he was referred to always as Omenka. Mm. You know, so the first page of his autobiography, which uh, we're trying to put together to publish now, he wrote, this book is written in honor of my own father, Omenka. So I said to myself, if I ever start a gallery, I'll call it Omenka. Now, why is Omenka unique? Omenka is unique because um, the artists that we represent, you know, have their own philosophy. It's very important. So um, we're, we're very um, focused on representing artists, you know, whose work resonates with the African continent because we believe in telling our own story. It's very important. Art history especially in Africa, has been written by the West. So I think it's about time we told our own story and presented facts the way, you know, they've actually occurred. Um, now, we, we also represent uh, not only Nigerian artists, we've got a Cameroonian artist, and we've got an American artist who's based in South Africa. But for us, what is important is that the themes resonate with the African continent. Okay. So that's very important for us. Omenka is unique because uh, we not only represent artists here, and not only are we interested in showing their works here, but we've been to art fairs on about five continents, mm -hmm. you know, showcasing you know, some of the most prestigious international art fairs like the Armory, like Art Dubai, like uh, Cape Town Art Fair and Joburg Art Fair. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for us to, you know, expose the artists as much as possible to broader audiences. Okay, and yes. did, did the artists contact you or you contacted them? Is that how it works? Um, it goes both it goes ways. Both ways. Yes. Okay. Now, if today I decided to become a curator, yes, or maybe a conservator, or yes. someone who handles art, yes. or who wants to become an is it how would you pronounce that word? Archivist, I think. Archivist, so. absolutely. Archivist, art, yes. yes. Do I what what background do I need to have educationally? Could you, could I be a sociology major who wants to become an art an art handler, or do I have to speci uh, specify or major in art history? Well, art history is very useful. Uh, there's no, you cannot underestimate that. You know, having um, 
any um, study of art is extremely important. But um, if you have sociology and you have a flair for art, you can become a good curator because you'll always bring your own strength. I mean, lots of these disciplines these days are borrowing from each other different theories. Even in art history, art history leans heavily on other philosophical themes, for mm-hmm. instance. So it's very important. You always find a common ground. But I think, by and large, what is important is that you also study as well. There are curatorial principles you must study. You must gain um, professional own on a hands-on experience. So I think these things will make you more rounded. And as a curator, you must continue to study. You must go for international residencies. You must read as broadly as possible because art is not just about enjoying it for the aesthetic purposes these days. Mm -hmm. It's all about how it fits, what relevance it has to society, Mm -hmm. what relevance it has to history, what relevance it has to us as a people informing our identities. You know, so especially in Africa where we're in the post-colonial realm, you know, trying to identify ourselves, trying to bring about what is true to our own roots and culture. You know, you must have a sense of history and sociology Mm -hmm. to be a successful curator. So there's no knowledge lost, you know, but you must also learn the principles of curating and it's all very research-based. Kind of going along with those lines, what would you say or what opinion do you have on the state of visual artists and arts in Nigeria? Well, I think that uh, it's on the rise. I mean, you you can't compare the state where we are now with 20 years ago. I mean, judging by the galleries, which are more professionally run, judging by the more exquisite catalogs, you know, containing critical text, you know, when you also consider that there's a secondary market now, we've got uh, two or three major auction houses that are doing extremely well and establishing the prices for Nigerian art and artists. You know, when you also look at the fact that we have international uh, events like the Lagos Biennale, you know, an Artex, you know, and auction houses like mm-hmm. Art House Contemporary. I think these are very important uh, factors. I mean, just the other day, um, the EMC Shillon Museum was mm-hmm. birthed, you know, so you can see that there's a structure now beginning to form, yeah. and that structure is extremely important. What we need now is public and private sector partnerships, the funding, how identifying the value chain, making sure there's government support, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in creating, you know, um, a level playing field, or to make sure that regulations, you know, you know, are in place. You know, for instance, we don't have uh, a national gallery of art, Mm. you know, just like you'd have maybe the British Museum, for instance, where you can see the heritage of a people, you know, and I think that's extremely important, you know, in understanding ourselves better, you know, as a people and showing peaceful coexistence and and tolerance, you know, these things are very important, you know, how are we not able to have a proper national gallery of art where people from all walks of life, you know, the international community can come to understand our peoples and culture better. Mm -hmm. You know, these are things that we need to have in place. How do we grow our tourism potential? You know, knowing full well that in all the developed climes, you know, this sort of, uh, this sort of structure, you know, is very useful to, to, uh, national development and tourism, for instance. So I think that, um, by and large, We've got staggering prices for art now. International auction houses, you know, are dedicating, you know, whole departments to the sales of African art, especially art from Nigeria. I mean, the other day we found uh, a tutu going for over a million pounds, but we still need structures. Yeah. We still need storage facilities, mm-hmm. companies, that, businesses that do storage, businesses that run uh, transport because it's an art, you mm-hmm. know, having to move art, especially if you are going to have to ship it abroad, for instance, it has to be safe. Insurance companies, for instance, that are specialized in insurance policies for art and artists because we're very specialized people, you know, very peculiar. Um, what else? We also need um, art lending companies. You know, if you say, for instance, that a tutu by Burning Wall went for over a million pounds, why is it that I cannot take that work? of art to a bank and get a loan for it. You know, these are structures, you know, and so there's still room for growth. Otherwise, what we'll find that is that in the next couple of years, you know, will be stagnated or it can even reverse you know, the growth achieved mm-hmm. so far. Yeah, because two of my questions I have actually kind of touched on is, for me, I hope that people who listen and watch this interview yes. are not just the 
Ajabota people. <laughs> I would hope people who are not Ajabota, even though that word is so annoying, but yes. my point is people who don't have an appreciation for art also watch this interview as well. Because mm. for me, the struggle I find in Nigeria is that a lot of times you see that it's just the people who have money that yes. appreciate art. Yes. But if we have, like you said, the government, maybe they're building institutions in slum place slum place places or places that are not well built there's like art on the wall there are art pieces that people can go, there are art exhibitions that people can go and see mm. then maybe the average nigerian child can have a better appreciation do you get what i'm trying to say absolutely so i don't know how the government can go about doing well, that the government can do that in terms of the education yes to which make is sure true. That even from um, ground level yes you know um Stu- students, pupils, mm-hmm. children, you know, encouraged, you know, the appreciation of mm-hmm. art. The government can make sure that public buildings and spaces are embellished with artworks, mm-hmm. beginning with the foreign missions, you know, and the embassies, very important. You know, when you come into Lagos, for instance, you cannot tell the people who they are, you know, by being in the airport, for instance, and that for me should be the very welcome notice to say you are in Nigeria. When you set out to travel to even uh, South Africa, for instance, you immediately pick up on the culture of the people. When you see the geometric forms and shapes of their art, you can tell that you are in South Africa. You know, what do we have as a people? And look at how unifying that force is. You know, even the artworks at uh, the Moita International Airport have been cordoned off, Mm. you know, and some have even been removed. So for me, that's a shame. Yeah. You know, so that's one step or one thing that the government can yeah. do. Now, is the government helping to encourage the private sector, for instance, to ensure um, that um, maybe through tax rebates to ensure that they support artists and, you know, do some serious policies towards the mm-hmm. arts. Uh, the government has come up with uh, uh, the CIFI initiative, you know, with the central bank, you know, but when you look at it, you know, there isn't anything for the visual artist. It's just technology, there's fashion, there's entertainment, mm-hmm. but the visual artists have been left out. Now, Alliance France says, you know, there's a building just down the road and it's being donated by a very successful businessman, Mike Adenuga, and yet we have parking issues because when you have major events there, the government has not been very forthcoming in supporting the visual arts, for instance. Mm-hmm. You know, And then you have a businessman, a local businessman, who has put his own personal wealth you know, in ensuring that uh, Lagos sits on the map mm-hmm. you know, and you have cars being towed away. Now, I know that that space, for instance, that is outside where the cars are being towed away, you know, it's problematic in the sense that cars shouldn't park there. But you can come to an agreement with the owners of the building and the French Cultural Centre mm-hmm. to find out how best, because whatever is being done in that place projects Lagos, yeah. projects the art and culture of the people. And if we say that we're trying to diversify away from oil, you know, how is it that this, this institution has not been called into a dialogue, mm-hmm. for instance. So these are ways that the government, you know, can play a very important role in ensuring that our culture is propagated, our culture is preserved and promoted. Very important. Yeah. And you kind of touched on a topic, which is why can't, why, why don't we have people or banks accepting art yes. as a means of people uh, obtaining loans? Yes. And what do you think that Nigerians, both the well-educated and the average Nigerian be able to understand about the intersection of art and money? Well, I think that uh, it's a problem that started a long time ago because uh, most um, parents wanted their children, like you mentioned earlier, to study other more fancied uh, professions Mm -hmm. like medicine, like law and engineering. But that is changing and we need to change with the times because um, and even the next 20, 30 years, it will even change further. Mm. Now, why is it changing? Because we're more people in the world now. Mm -hmm. So you need more professions. You know, more people are venturing into different areas. You know, there's more of an appreciation of culture. Now, most countries have gone through major experiences. Take Nigeria, for instance, right? Uh, this is, this is a country that has been suppressed for a long time, you know, the colonial incursion, and then after that, um, uh, the military rule. Now the people are coming out, forming their characters, and want to express themselves, you know, and there's no gain saying that with that expression, you know, it's very interesting to an international community. So with that, 
comes more jobs. Curators, art historians, restorers, conservators, art writers, mm -hmm. critics come to the fore. Those who are doing the auctions will come to the fore. You know, mm -hmm. so for me, um, these are occurrences, you know, that bring about new job opportunities. Now, in the next couple of years, when there's a, a look away from oil as a, as a model product, then culture takes, uh, follows suit very easily. Now, what's the government doing? to ensure that in like in all the climes, you know, culture, you know, the creative economy becomes a mainstay or plays a more important role. Because in other countries it is, you know, so that phase has changed. Yeah. Where there's only respect for those aforementioned mm -hmm. um, professions. Now even within the cultural industry, there's artificial intelligence and virtual reality. Mm -hmm. You know, how are we forming the bridges between culture artificial intelligence and virtual reality. Mm -hmm. What is the government doing, you know, in promoting these various, various uh, genres or mm -hmm. finding an, inter an intersection mm -hmm. between these because that's the way of the future now. Of now, in the next couple of years from now, when Nigeria becomes the third most populous country in the world mm -hmm. and learning must change because learning isn't going to be based on what you can recall and write down. Mm -hmm. Already we've lagged behind in the sense that while other developed countries were learning principles of physics and applications, we were stuck in just regurgitating the theory. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the reason why you find even our scientists not focused on research. Yeah. You find even our scientists able to recite Newton's law, laws of motion mm -hmm. without knowing the applications. And that's why you see many engineers in our universities or those graduates of engineering mm -hmm. or universities not even able to build mm -hmm. because they weren't supported. In the universities today, you find many academics more interested in promotions, mm. you know, rather than research and developing because they've not been supported and because the economy is not, has never really been in a good state yeah. in the last couple of decades, it has been more important to put something on the table. So they vie for promotions with half-baked research papers. And that has been the bane of Nigeria. Now, in the next couple of years, when countries going towards electrical cars, uh, going towards renewable sources of energy, when education now becomes what you can do because all these traditional jobs are going to be phased out because of, because of the advent of virtual reality and artificial intelligence. What happens? What happens? You know, so these are things we must think about because we're going to have a phase where even those who are YouTubing, it becomes a proper, proper profession. Mm -hmm. you know, so even our education, the orientation, the curriculum must change. I, as you're just seeing all of that, my, my, I just, I was feeling very sad because, first of all, my issue is the fact that why does it seem like when government officials go to foreign countries and they see the things that are happening, they see how development, how technology is moving so fast, how things are developing so fast, there's such a huge problem in trying to replicate that. Even maybe not replicate that, adapt that to yes. Nigeria. Why? Why do you think we have that? Well, I think that... Uh it's not just a problem that uh, started yesterday. I think it's a problem that um, started a couple of decades ago. And I say this because there, there are many projects that have been introduced that I find very strange. And I think that uh, some of these projects or initiatives, uh, you know, other developed countries do not adopt them. And one of this is um, the quota system. You know, how do you get um, to be very good at what you do when you're not judged, you know, on the merits the merit. of your abilities? You're judged because you come from a particular region in the country, you know, and uh, that's not good. That's not good at all. And it goes without saying that when you have such products getting into the choicest secondary schools from common entrance level, and you can see how it's developed as you go along mm -hmm. up to university level, and these graduates come out, who are not the best you have, and some of these people get the best jobs. So right from the very start, because they don't even have the capacity or the abilities, they can't think out of the box, they cannot improve, they can only imitate to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, it even takes an intelligent person to imitate. For instance, you know, if you look at a beautiful piece of art, you know, why do you need experts to detect a forgery? 
you know, because the forgers are good. Yeah. So there must be some sort of intelligence or skill that comes in even imitations. Now, if you have the wrong set of people getting the jobs, you're only going to have square pegs and round holes. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why, that's one reason rather, we haven't moved forward or are finding it difficult to move forward. Yeah. Now, if you look at even choicey appointments, or should I say appointments that, that have to be filled by technical people, technocrats, you know, have the wrong people there. You know, it goes without saying, there can be much success, mm -hmm. you know, in these areas. You know, so I think that there's a problem. Yeah, and yes. just even talking about the different types of careers you can have at yes. a museum, a gallery or a museum, like from an art curator, yes. someone who handles art, an archivist. Why is it that if a foreign person tells you that I'm going to charge you a hundred thousand dollars? As Nigerians, we're so happy to give away that money. But if uh, a Nigerian who's even probably more qualified than the foreign counterpart charges you that same amount, we're so quick to say you're charging too much. Like, why do we undervalue ourselves? Yes. I feel like it's demonic. I agree with you. But I think that um, it's because there isn't an appreciation of history. There isn't an appreciation of culture. We don't value ourselves because we don't know who we are. And that, for me, is the role of art and culture in a society. With art and culture, you will have a value of who you are. Mm -hmm. You will have a value. You have your own identity. And these are things that have been taken away from our schools. You know, how many schools are studying history? How many schools are studying art? Mm -hmm. You know, how many spaces are there for you to understand yourself? For instance, in museums, how many museums are functional? And are keeping in time. You know, keeping you know in tune with today's 21st century museum practices. How do you have a vision, a collective vision, a collective identity? How can you move forward without spaces like this? You yeah. know, to help you define who you are, understand where yeah. you're going, and where you're coming from. Yeah. Because in museums, typically, even by the educational programs that they have, you know, you find out that they teach a better understanding of who we are. How do you cope, for instance, with the Boko Haram menace? It's an ideology. You don't fight Boko Haram with arms. You fight an, you're fighting an ideology, you know, and it can only be um, best tackled or engaged with by increasing understanding of who you are. If I go to a museum, for instance, and I'm, I always happen to attend educational programs at the museums, and just by looking at the art, I can understand your culture better, and I'll have a better understanding of who you are, the way you think, and I'll know that we're not different, you know, and we actually come from the same progenitors. You know, so I think that it's the way of life, you know, an ideology which culture, you know, can best tackle. And if we have these things absent, of course we're going to have this problem. So I, that's why I keep going back to the fact that the foundation is weak. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to continue to fast and pray for Nigeria, Shan, because Absolutely. it just breaks my heart when yes. we see people that are so deserving of yes. earning so much money. But Absolutely. we say, I'm not going to pay Oliver that amount yes. of money because Oliver is Nigerian and... Yes. Someone else, Shade says, oh, yes. <laughs> oh yeah, Shade, here's my money. I just yes. go, do you know, and it just brings because mine. Because true culture, we can, um, we'll, be, we'll be better placed to understand, you know, the rigors of colonialism and how it affected us. You know, and with that, you will have a better understanding of who you are and mm -hmm. take pride in yourself as a way from appreciating colonial values so much that they're having a detriment to yourself. Yeah. He says, because we don't know who we are. That's true. And it's quite sad. Quite but sad. one of the ways that <laughs> your foundation is bringing joy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. One of the ways yes. that the Ben Enwonwu Foundation is continues to promote your father's legacy is through the Ben Enwonwu Distinguished Lecture Series. Yes. And it's, you have the point of view, yes. which is held in partnership with the Alliance how do you pronounce that again? Alliance Francaise. Alliance Francaise, sorry. Francaise. 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 So Alliance Francaise, oh, which, is my, <laughs> <laughs> which is in like Adenaga Center. Can yes. you talk a bit about the lecture series? Well, the lecture series, uh, we've had about 10 or 11 distinguished lectures now. And uh, it's about the role of art in shaping society. Mm. Because at the foundation, we 
are not just promoting art for art's sake. And what I mean is that it's not just about the aesthetic value of art, but how relevant is art to society? How can art shape society? So we look very closely at these, at this. Uh, we talk about uh, pressing issues, for instance, at the point of view series, we talked about climate change. You know, how are artists and creatives working together to inspire change, to, to impact on policy, you know, in bringing about change? You know, in what ways? These are things that we talk about. So, you know, for us, we are, we're very happy with uh, the dividends so far. We've had all sorts of international speakers, from renowned academics to celebrity figures like Wale Shoenka, who is also Africa's uh, Niger's first Nobel uh, laureate, right. for instance. And they've all shared their perspectives on how art, and it's been very interesting because it's, art, like I mentioned, doesn't exist anymore in isolation, but it exists, you know, in... Um, confluence rather with other professions and when you have artists creatives thinking creatively and the policy makers on that same stage you know also adapting policy because policy brings about the change then you can find that there's actually going to be change do you is there a way that and this is i'm not i'm not, I'm not your board or anything yeah. but do you think that there's a way that we can make this these point of view talks in some way accessible to the not lower income people, but people who may not have a better appreciation of art so that they understand why art is important. Oh, yes, because um, even from the outset, and even in the planning stage, it's actually conceived to ensure that everyone has a say. Even thinking of the name, point of view. Mm, What's true. your point of view? Yeah. You know, so we want everyone to speak. Mm -hmm. you know, and like I mentioned, it's not just about art. You know, the, 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 the broader concept is about getting policymakers in sure. there. It's about getting government officials in there. It's about getting business people in there because we want public and private sector partnership mm -hmm. in promotion of our creative economy. So it's about bringing all these people there to share their points of view. Yeah. How can we go forward? Yeah. Because now we're no longer relying on oil. We want to look away. We want to build the creative economy. We know how important the economy, the creative economy is to Niger's GDP. We know how important creatives are in envisioning a new future, you know, and a future that's good for successive generations. We know how the creative economy is, or creatives are, even in in even rebranding the country. I mean, we've got so many various uh, negative stereotypes, you know, being thrust on us on by the international media and even the West. You know, they talk of a country that is corrupt. They talk of a country that is uh, riddled with um, poverty. Insecurity. You know, and when you look at the good side of Africa, for instance, you think only of the safari because that's what has been branded all around on, on mm -hmm. uh, Western media. So it's high time they look at Africans and Nigerians differently. Mm. Are we telling our own story? Because even in the West, you know, they have their own issues, you know, but they've been very clever, you know, at hiding them and only yes. projecting the beautiful sides, you know, and that's why they gain so much from tourism. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing as a people with Nigeria, you know, as being as rich and as wealthy as it is, even in terms of natural resources and beautiful spaces, historical locations and geographical locations, you know, what are we projecting to the world? You know, so I think these are very, very important, you know, and, you know, what other way can you project a country mm -hmm. if not through creative means and True. through creativity? Mm. Uh, think of Picasso and Spain. Think about Picasso who even adopted France as his own country, mm -hmm. though he was Spanish. You know, think about what his image did for that country, for instance. You know, all over the world, cultural brokers are the most powerful. So it's not you know, how much you spend on advertising or taking out adverts on international media, but what are you doing in terms of the creatives? Because I think through creativity, we can actually rebrand our country and tackle, you know, or change negative stereotypes of yeah. our country. And I always tell people that at the end of the day, yes. when we travel, yes. we're going to always be identified as Nigerians. Absolutely. Nobody's going to say you're Igbo, Hausa, Yoruba, Absolutely. you know, wherever it is. Absolutely. And until we get that, that Absolutely. we have to have we have to be unified as people because nobody's going to ask you, oh, Oliver, are you Igbo, are you Shadi, are you yeah. Oba? You know, and I hopefully we get that. I think we're the only ones who do that here. Yeah. Because it's... we do that to ourselves, like you mentioned yeah. earlier. We ask who we are, up to your compound, what state are you from, what yes, tribe are you yes, from, yes. up to whose son are you, you know, what compound, you know, and there shouldn't be. Yeah, but even if, even I think even if, even if that's going to be there, that's fine. But yeah. can we still have a unified sense of... Absolutely. 
we are all Nigerians. Absolutely. Because if you go to other countries, there are people who are still Americans, but they're African Americans, or they're, you know, so there's no issue with that. I just feel like we tend to carry this individualistic mindset that is so mm. detrimental to Nigeria being unified. You and just hit it on the head. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> and just to point to your comment, I've actually attended two of your lectures. Beautiful. And it's raising capital against high value works of art and museums, tourism, and urban development. Fantastic. And they were really. Hope you enjoyed them. I did. That's, what, that's what I was about to say. You're right, though, that there were lots of people there. So it wasn't right. just about people who were influential, like wealthy. Absolutely. There were people from different perspectives Absolutely. and had different, you know, different industries as well. Points of view. <laughs> <laughs> you sell them. You yes. sell them. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Finally, okay. using your father as a reference point yes. and looking at how much you have achieved yourself. What advice would you give to visual artists who are trying to not only achieve financial success, but also want to have longevity with their careers? Well, I think that you must not rest on your oars. You know, having temporary or fleeting success doesn't mean you've arrived yet. And every, any great artist or any person who's achieved anything you know, in life, you know, has always not rested. You continue to strive to achieve perfection and excellence because uh, the boundaries of knowledge you can only push forward by little bit. You know, all those have come before you and uh, you must, you know, achieve something to show that uh, you are counted. What impact do you have in your generation? What have you left, you know, whose life has, has you changed? But I think by far the most important uh, piece of advice I'll give anyone, especially a black person, is constantly read. Just devour everything that you have in sight because, uh, you know, it affects you. Knowledge is power. You know, there's this saying that if you want to hide anything hide from a, a black man, put it in a book. It broadens your mind. You can travel in a book. You can speak better in a book. You can improve yourself in a book. You know, and there's so much information out there that, you'll, that is really in common place, but you'll never find it if you don't read. So for me, that's any advice. You want longevity, reinvent yourself. The only way you can do that is by reading. Yeah. Information is power. All right, let's go on to the one random questions. Are you ready? Sure. Okay. First question is, what do you do to unwind? What do I do to unwind? I like watching people. Oh. Yes, yeah, so sometimes I might just uh, I make friends. Uh, I make friends easily. Sometimes I want to watch a movie, something relaxing, you know, because uh, I work around the clock. So for me, it's important sometimes you have to unwind. I like to listen to music. I'm very eclectic. So I like anything from soul to new soul to R&B. I like the oldies because I think they carry stronger messages and I can relate better to them as opposed to the new age songs that uh, uh, mainly for me, that's for me, very sexual in nature, so I'm not very inclined <laughs> to do <to> that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the second yes. person I've interviewed this year, I'm like, I guess it's a generation of <laughs> yeah, people. it's just too sexual. I think that uh, it's all a marketing tool. I mean, if you've got substance, you don't have to. But Yes, that's but, my take. But the old songs that you you, you claim to like, yes. they were, I keep on saying that they were sexual. So not is it really, that they were not overly sexual? Not overly sexual. They, they spoke more of love, there was respect. You know, yeah. As opposed to, you know, I don't want to mention some of these things. Yeah, but nice. and they were and the and today's songs actually um, the base women in a way. Yeah. Because you know, you watch some of these videos and people are tossing dollar bills and that's debasing as far as I'm concerned. Popping money, okay. <laughs> <laughs> who's your favorite? You know, I'm going to do that. Who's your favorite new age artist of twenty? Who was your favorite of twenty nineteen? Yes. Nigerian. Yes. Well, like Asha. Okay. New, right. age. okay, new age. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. She still counts. Yeah, no, no, yeah, still okay, counts. okay. Like Asha. So, Asha, cool. Yeah. Third question: Complete the sentence. Life is beautiful. That's yes. good. What are two things that people may not know about you? Mm. Not many people would know that I'm a very quiet person deep mm. down inside because uh, I um, organize a lot of events, and uh, people see that. You know, and then it's very easy to think I'm an extrovert, but deep down I like my own space. Final question, you can only keep one. Which are you picking and why? Anyang Wu at the headquarters of the UN in New York, Songo at the power holding company of Nigeria, headquarters in Lagos, or the drummer at the Nitel office in Lagos? Anyang Wu. Why? <laughs> because of what it represents. Mm. It represents... Um, an emergent African nation, because at that time, 
many nations in Africa were gaining independence. So it speaks of a people who are getting liberated. It speaks of a people coming into their own. And it was created in promotion of world peace. And so for me, easily, I'd resonate with that because that uh, embraces almost everything that I do. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your time, thank Oliver. You thank you, okay. Shadi. This episode is produced and edited by me, Bola Shade Anozie. Theme song for the show is by Imodu Ayonote. The podcast is available on Audio Mac, Podbean, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and Stitcher Radio. Simply search for the SNC Podcast, which is one word, no spacing. You can also check us out on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at the SNC Podcast. Still one word, no spacing. Thank you for listening. <laughs>